here today at the headquarters of the World Jewish Congress in New York City, the international organization that represents Jewish communities and organizations in 100 countries around the world. My name is Naomi Reinhartz, and I am a member of the World Jewish Congress's Jewish Diplomatic Corps. The JD Corps is a network of young professionals acting in the fields of diplomacy and public policy on behalf of world Jewry around the world. The World Jewish Congress recently launched a webinar series in which we have speakers come and discuss issues related to anti-Semitism and the state of Israel. And today we are delighted to have Consul General Donnie Dayan come and join us. Donnie Dayan has been in New York serving as Consul General from Israel since August 2016. As Consul General, he represents the state of Israel to communities in New York as well as in other communities around the city. Um, I'd love to start the conversation by asking you about your first year here in New York and what it's been like for you. Hectic. <laughs> <laughs> Hectic as the city, interesting and exciting as the city, and diverse as the city. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I really, I think I, I, I work 24-7 because uh, sometimes even Shabbat, uh, uh, when I visit uh, communities, uh, congregations, it's also a kind, I must admit, a kind of uh, working too. Uh, but uh, it's extremely interesting. Uh, actually, I'm not a career diplomat, so I, I'm really not in a position to be accurate when I compare. But my perception is that this is the most interesting position the Israeli Foreign Service can offer, can offer a diplomat. Well, it's certainly one of the most important posts yes, that an Israeli diplomat can have. Yes, one of the so-called core missions of uh, the State mm -hmm. of Israel. And actually, uh, uh, we are the largest one in the world, right. largest than all our embassies. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about wh what a typical day would look like for you? Well, uh, there are no typical <laughs> days. That's right. one of the <laughs> advantages of this uh, position. But uh, I would say that uh, a lot of meetings with extremely interesting persons uh, regarding issues uh, that uh, relate to Israel, uh, many speaking opportunities. I make uh, an effort to be as frequent as possible in colleges, in universities, uh, not just to address uh, uh, pro-Israel groups. Uh, I'm even more interested to address those that are skeptic towards Israel. You know, the first week I arrived to New York, I told my staff, look, I can start my day. My, I can every day go to a uh, pro-Israel Orthodox community, and then to an evangelical temple, and a maybe a Tea Party rally, <laughs> and get three standing ovations. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not interesting. In the end of the day, I did nothing. I want to do exactly the opposite, to go to places that don't hate Israel, but are skeptic, have relevant questions that merit answers regarding Israel, and try to uh, uh, make that make a difference there. That's wonderful, and that's unique for a, for a diplomat. Um, is it what you expected to be in New York? I mean, with such a large and diverse community, is it is it what you Well, you predicted? know, no, me, uh, New York, I am not a stranger to New York. Right. Uh, I never lived in New York. I don't think that I've ever been to New York before I came here more than 10 or 10 consecutive days, maybe two weeks. But I've been to New York at least uh, 30 times. Mm -hmm. So no, I cannot say I was surprised by New York. I expected uh, uh, to find what I found, uh, both in the Jewish community and the general society. Um, that being said, I must uh, admit something that maybe it's not too diplomatic to say. You mm. know. Uh, uh, when I was younger, uh, I loved New York. And then as I grew older, I, my preference went to more sedate places like Paris, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, enjoying the city as it's, as, uh, uh, per se, but uh, I am enjoying tremendously the, the work I'm doing in the city. Oh, that's wonderful. Then I, li I, I would say it this way. I like New Yorkers. <laughs> I don't like New York so right. much. <laughs> right, I've heard that before. <laughs> One thing that's interesting about you is that you were born in, in Argentina and that you're fluent in Spanish. And I know that you've yeah. already made some inroads with the diverse Latino community here. And I'm curious yeah. how you've gone about doing that. Well, you know, when I came to New York, uh, I, uh, we had a few strategy sessions with my staff, with my senior staff. And uh, we identified three non-Jewish top priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was the Latino community. 
Um, it, it has nothing to do, I think, with the fact that I myself, I, in some sense, I am a Latino. Yeah, I was I born in Buenos Aires. I, I brand myself as the first mm -hmm. Latino Consul General of Israel in New York. Yeah. Uh, but to, we have to understand the importance of the Latino community. It's the fastest growing. Uh, New York City itself has already 27 percent uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Latino population. Mm -hmm. In 40 years, the, this country will have uh, uh, 30, 33 percent of uh, Latino electorate. Uh, so we have to start now to reach out in order to maintain the alliance that we have the, with the American society. The second top priority we defined is uh, the liberals. Um, I, um, we see a sense, a certain uh, gap between the levels of support we have in conservative mm -hmm. slash Republican mm -hmm. uh, uh, places uh, uh, and against Lati uh, liberal or, 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 or democratic. And I, want, I, I am a great uh, believer in, bipart in the need of Israel to be bipartisan in American politics. Actually, if you think about it, the, the unique alliance that we have with the United States was forged by two presidents. Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, Richard Nixon, a, a, a Republican. Those were the two presidents that really converted the friendship into a staunch alliance. And I think it's no coincidence that there were one Democrat and one Republican. We needed one Democrat and one Republican consecutive presidents to make that into a real strong alliance. Mm. And uh, therefore, I, I, I um, invest a large amount, a large proportion of my time to reach out to liberal audiences to liberal leaders, uh, etc. And the third, obviously, is the millennials. Mm -hmm. For me, I must, mm -hmm. I must admit, it's the most difficult of the three. <laughs> I am not sure I understand uh, exactly <laughs> till this very day uh, this generation, mm -hmm. but uh, fortunately, I have millennials as my uh, aides and my, in my Good. staff, so Good. they do most of the work. Good. Do you feel like you've made success in those three in those three areas? Yes, I think. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you can never uh, cease, you can never stop. It's an ongoing endeavor. But uh, yes, I think we have uh, uh, made uh, serious inroads for sure to the Latino community uh, in the areas I cover, uh, the five states I cover. Um, yes, we have extremely good relationship we forge with the Latino community. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges that Israel has today abroad. There's many challenges on a day-to-day -day basis um, in terms of the Israel diaspora relationship, which is a big priority of yours, of course, as Consul General. You know, Naomi, when I was appointed by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I was asked by, to, by Prime Minister Netanyahu to come to New York. Well, my first thought was uh, what a privilege is to represent the capital of the world, Jerusalem, to the city that for some reason believes that is the <laughs> capital of the world, New York. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and the second thing I remember from those days when, uh, I must admit I was uh, quite excited by the offer I received from the Prime Minister. Um, I remember that uh, at a certain point my wife, Einat, told me, you know, Danny, I hear you, 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 you speak about your plans for New York. And you speak a lot about your plans regarding the Jewish community. And if she said, now you are going to be a senior diplomat, you should speak more about Iran, Palestinians, to sound like a mm -hmm. senior diplomat. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, when uh, Einat and I have different opinions in certain matters, 99% of the cases she is right. <laughs> but in this case, I think she was wrong. Oh. I think that there is no highest uh, uh, privilege and importance to be the, represent the, the diplomatic representative of, of Israel to the American Jewish community, which in some senses that is mm -hmm. one of the tasks of the Consul General in New York. 40-45% uh, of the Jewish community in this country is in the five states mm -hmm. that I cover, and mm -hmm. even more important, the headquarters of most uh, major Jewish organizations, including obviously the World Jewish Congress, are in New York. So in some sense, the Consul General in New York is the ambassador of Israel to the American Jewish community. And I think there is no more important task than that, especially mm -hmm. in these days in which uh, uh, there are problems mm -hmm. in the relationship. Are there things that you want to educate the Jewish community in New York 
about? Are there things that they should know about Israel that they that they don't know enough Actually, about? Actually, I think I, uh, 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 <coughs> you know, when a person is nominated as, let's say, Israel, um, Israel's ambassador to Belgium, so it's obvious he represents Israel in Belgium. The American Jewish community is not a foreign country. It's part of us. It's our President Rivlin uh, used to speak about the five tribes that it is composed Israel, the secular Israelis, the modern Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox, and the Arabs. I said, well, there are five tribes. The, 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 the diaspora Jewry is our fifth mm -hmm. tribe. So I represent, I see as my duty to, repre to, to, uh, to be a bi-directional ambassador, mm. to represent Israel to the American Jewish community, obviously, not only to American Jewish community, to, to, to the areas I'm in charge of, but also to represent the American Jewish community to the Israeli public. And if you said educate, I think we need education both sides of the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, we need education to educate Americans, Jews and non-Jews, about the real facts about Israel, mm -hmm. but we also need to uh, make a kind of acquaintance uh, to, to educate the Israeli society about the American jury, which is an, 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 an exciting, vibrant jury. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, one other question is, I know you care a lot about tikkun olam, and how can all of us here in the states that you represent do a better job of conveying to our communities this, the importance of tikkun olam to Israel, the spirit of Israel? Um, whether you startup know, nation or, or th another that's way. That's also interesting that you use the word spirit. Because I noticed that Americans speak about the American dream. There is no something, there is no such word, there is no such uh, idiom, the Israeli dream. We don't use it. But we do use the Israeli spirit. Mm. Ruach Israel. Can't. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's uh, a significant difference. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, Israel today in so many senses uh, uh, represents the, the, the Ruach Israeli, the Israeli spirit. Um, I just met a few days ago with uh, uh, an amazing group of volunteers that is doing, Israeli volunteers that making incredible work in Puerto Rico, in Dominica, in other places that were shattered, they were de uh, uh, devastated by the last, uh, by the last hurricanes, including in, in Houston. Mm. Um, as we speak, there are vol Israeli volunteers virtually in, in, in the four corners of the world uh, uh, doing uh, assistance. Uh, and even, you know, things that are made for profit, but uh, uh, not long ago, a few weeks ago, an American company acquired uh, an Israeli one, f uh, Kite Pharma, uh, for the staggering amount of more than $10 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in the business of curing leukemia. Wow. That means that if someone paid $10 billion for that, it's very probable the cure of at least certain types of leukemia will come from Jerusalem Wonderful. by Israelis. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, 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 really, you know, uh, I was in, uh, we, are, we are doing extremely well economically these mm -hmm. days and led by the innovation sector. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when you, are, you, when you have technological know-how and, and, and advanced uh, 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 know-how technology, um, the question really, how do you use it? Mm -hmm. And I am proud to say that we use that uh, uh, advanced technology uh, for really for Tikkun Olam. I was in in the sidelines of the uh, previous General Assembly of the UN. I'm not in charge of the UN, but obviously when the Prime Minister was here, sure. I escorted him to mm -hmm. the UN. And in the sidelines of the General Assembly, he convened a meeting with 12 African leaders. Mm -hmm. And in that meeting, um, Israeli companies presented um, innovations that already help Africa. Mm. For instance, a machine that converts the humidity in the air into drinking water to be used in barren areas that don't have access to clean water. Or a non-intrusive device that can monitor your internal organs and transmit it by satellite to a specialist sitting in Tel Aviv, New York, or, 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 or any other place in the world uh, to diagnose. And even if you excuse me, uh, 
<laughs> do it yourself uh, circumcision tool <laughs> that helps prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Wow. Uh, a tool that Prime Minister Netanyahu referred to as cutting edge technology. <laughs> <laughs> well uh, and those are the things that we are doing today for the sake of the world. And uh, I'm extremely proud of it. By the way, if I may add, even not only using our high tech our high technology. The fact that as we are speaking now, Naomi, mm -hmm. young Israeli men and women are endangering their lives in order to extend humanitarian aid to Syrian refugees, mm -hmm. to, to Syrian citizens mm -hmm. inside Syria, mm -hmm. being the only country in the world that does it inside Syria, wow. clothes and medicine and, and, and construction material and many other things, I think I'm, it makes me very proud to represent Israel. Sure, I can, I can see why. Can you speak, you've, you've, you're one year down and you still have some time he left here in New York. Can you talk a little bit about what you hope to accomplish in your next several years here? Well, um, uh, you <laughs> know, uh, ultimately the um, goal of uh, any diplomatic mission is to garner support for your country and to garner support for the policy of your government also. I always say I represent the whole Israeli society. I represent the, the LGBT uh, 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 activist from Tel Aviv and also the ultra-Orthodox rabbi from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I represent the uh, Muslim Israeli from Sakhnin and the uh, Jewish settler from Kiryat Arba. Uh, but I represent one policy, the policy of the government that was democratically elected by the citizens of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that is the, the main the main task to, to continue to do it, uh, but I must admit that uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the relationship between Israel and the American Jewish community has become really uh, so close to my heart. Uh, and I devote to that in some senses more than I expected, but uh, I think that's the, what is needed right now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Is there a favorite part of your your day? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually I, I must admit that uh, it's, a, it's a so interesting, so diverse the position that the, my day is so diverse mm -hmm. uh, with media. With uh, look, uh, our our mission, our consulate deals with politics and diplomacy and economy and commerce and culture. By the way, I love the fact that we have a large cultural department that promotes Israel, uh, Israeli culture in, 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 in the areas we are in charge of, uh, Jews, non-Jews, diverse communities. So it's really, I must admit that when I, you know, I'm a little bit tired, the uh, problems, I go to our cultural department and sit there for a few uh, minutes, a few moments speaking mm -hmm. with our cultural staff about their programs, their uh, uh, initiatives and that uh, is the best relief. We have really uh, an amazing cultural scene these days in Israel uh, that really makes us uh, so proud uh, uh, from, from the Batsheva uh, uh, ballet to, 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 to the best, to exciting writers and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, films, uh, etc. So that's, that's a I, uh, there are diplomats that think that culture is, uh, uh, you know, a luxury. You don't need really need that in in a diplomatic mission. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad we have it. Yeah, I can imagine. And one thing also you mentioned earlier about your outreach to to the liberal groups and people that may not be the automatic, you know, um, rah rah people for Israel. You've had a lot of success doing that. Is there yeah, is I, there a strategy I, that that's been the most effective for you? Yeah, I think that you know. I, I often quote uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio without entering into local New York politics, mm -hmm. uh, in spite of the fact we are already after the election, right, so it's, right. it's easier. But uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio uses to say that uh, his support for Israel stems from the fact that he is a progressive, mm. not in spite of the fact that he's a progressive, but his progressive values convert him into a supporter of Israel. And I think that's completely right. I think that Israel have merits uh, to be a progressive cause, a liberal cause in American politics. 
And I try uh, very hard uh, to explain that. Mm -hmm. uh, to explain, for instance, the fact that it's not at all obvious. You know, Israel is a democracy. The fact that Israel is in democracy from the, from the day of its inception is not an obvious thing. I, think about it, Nomi. Israel was established during the war mm -hmm. by mainly two communities that were devoid from any legacy of democracy, Eastern European Jews and Middle Eastern Jews. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what is democracy. They didn't live through democracy. Nevertheless, when they came to Eretz Israel, when they came to Israel and founded, the they established the country in the midst of a terrible world in which we paid the, and, and a daunting price and then waves of immigrants that we have to absorb. Nevertheless, for in, there was no doubt for one second we are going to be a democracy. And I'm very proud. Look, our democracy, as any other democracy, is not perfect. There is no perfect democracy. Uh, but uh, we can be very proud of it. Uh, the fact that, you know, uh, we have su Supreme Court uh, m members that are judges that are from the Muslim Arab minority, uh, a deputy commissioner of the police is a, a, a Muslim Arab, etc., etc. The second thing, you know, uh, there is in, lib in some liberal uh, 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 some liberals say that the notion of a, a nation state is, is old fashioned and, mm. and ask why why you're so adamant in the need to have a Jewish state. Mm -hmm. um, you know my answer to that Noam is that uh, what is a Jewish state? A Jewish state is not a state in which Jews have more privileges or rights than non Jews. On the contrary, in a Jewish state is a must that every person will have the same uh, rights, Jew or non-Jew. Uh, a Jewish state is not an halachic state uh, ruled by the religious Jewish law. On the contrary, a Jewish state can take into consideration religious values, but the legislation is secular. I will tell you what is a Jewish state and why we need it so badly. A Jewish state is a state in which when a Jewish community is in danger, in that case the Jewish community of Ethiopia, the Prime Minister of the, that country calls the CEO of the airline, the national airline, in this case El Al, and tells him, Mr. CEO, you are going to cancel all the commercial flights of your company to New York, to Hong Kong, to Beijing, to London, lose millions. You will strip all the seats from the aircraft in order to make more room to human beings. I will, you will send them for 36 hours to Addis Ababa to uh, rescue the Jewish community. That is a Jewish state. No more than that, but not also no less than that. And you know, if that community in danger weren't a Jewish community, we would participate in the effort, as we do in Haiti, as we do in Nepal, and we do other places when there are catastrophes in uh, uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. But to such extent, we do it for a Jewish community. And on the other hand, we know that for a Jewish community, only a Jewish state will do that. How do we know? Because unfortunately, we have the experience that when Jews were, in, 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 uh, were massacred and there was no Jewish state, no one came to rescue them. So that's the reason we say. And I, I can't think of a more liberal reason to mm -hmm. have a Jewish state than that. That's beautiful. It's a wonderful way to put it. And Yeah, and <laughs> uh, so, and you know, and then we go to the to the Palestinian issue. And look, I fully understand that the current situation is uh, problematic. But the current situation is a result of the fact that uh, we recognize that there are two national groups that are indigenous to what we call Eretz Israel and the the Palestinian calls Palestine or Palestine. And we recognized, and that's the reason we always accept that we just celebrated 70 years from the partition resolution, which we accepted, mm -hmm. and the Arabs rejected. Unfortunately, uh, the Palestinians continue to see us, not only, not the settlers, I mean Tel Aviv, as, a co as, as foreigners. 
And as long as that is the situation, I am pessimistic that we will make the necessary compromises, the compromises that are needed to make peace. You know, I was, uh, a few weeks ago, I was in a certain synagogue here in Manhattan, and the keynote speaker was the Secretary General of the UN, mm. Mr. Guterres. And Mr. Guterres said the following, and I quote exactly, I believe. Quote, the temple that the Romans destroyed in the year 70 in Jerusalem was a Jewish temple, unquote. No political conclusion, nothing. Just a well-known historical fact. Mm -hmm. The following day, the Palestinian envoy to the UN presented a strong protest to the General Secretary General, saying that he should retract his statement that is an affront to the Palestinian people. As long as that is the way they educate the, the people, we are going further and further from, from peace because you don't compromise with, with someone that you educate that is a colonialist. That's the reason, Nomi, I, will, I always say that the most important person in the peace process is not the President of the United States, with all due respect, and not the Prime Minister of Israel, and not even the President of the Palestinian Authority. The most important person right now in the peace process is the Minister of Education of mm. the Palestinian Authority. And uh, when they will start to educate that Jews are also indigenous, not exclusively, also indigenous to that patch of land that we call Earth Israel and they call Palestine, all other issues, I believe, are technicalities that will be solved quite quickly. Unfortunately, we are not there yet. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you stay an optimist or do you...? <laughs> well, <coughs> unfortunately, when I see the, 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 the tendencies in the Palestinian society, uh, it's very difficult to yeah. be uh, optimistic. But, uh, you know, our, our late President Shimon Peres, in one of his innumerable uh, uh, original uh, uh, sayings said that uh, the, difference be the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is uh, they both die the same way. An optimist and a pessimist die the same way, but they live completely different. Mm. So mm -hmm. recommended to be an optimist, <laughs> and I take that recommendation. You might as well. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. Exactly. I had an, one more question. Earlier you mentioned when you talked about the liberals and um, the other groups that you work with here in the Latino communities, you also mentioned the millennials, which is my mm -hmm. peer group and many of the JD cores are, are millennials, as you know. Why are they the most difficult? <laughs> you know, uh, when I arrived in New York, my spokesperson took me uh, to a tour of many media outlets. We were in the New York Times and we were in this and we were in that. CNN and CBS, etc., etc. And then we went to a certain website, the, the headquarters of a certain website that caters to millennials. Uh, a quite uh, uh, impressive one. The, the guy that runs, that established and ran the website, he already interviewed President Obama and Prime Minister Cameron Fra of the uh, UK. Uh, mm -hmm. A successful one. He's 20, he was 28 at that time. I asked him for how long he runs the operation. He said for three years, since he was 25, very impressive. And then I asked him, by the way, Jewish guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then I asked him, what's your secret? How did you do that? And he said, do you see, take a look, do you see 200 people here working, uh, typing in their laptops and tablets and iPhones and computers? I said, yeah, sure, I see. Okay, he said, the oldest one here is 31. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to be the secret. Uh, mm -hmm. Only millennials uh, know, know how to speak to millennials. Fortunately, I have a, a wonderful staff of millennials, but uh, uh, I think that this is the only issue in which they give me orders. I don't give them orders right. because <laughs> they know better. Right. Well, that's why you have a staff to... Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, and you also cooperate with other organizations that have not said millennials, like, like WJC. Right. Well, uh, we very much appreciate that you, that you do take the time to speak to us. And um, we also have questions from the audience that will, be, that will be coming in. And again, this is a webinar series with Consul General Danny Dayon, who's here with us at the World Jewish Congress headquarters. 
if you have questions, you can, you can post them now. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, whether you're in touch with the college campuses in the areas in yeah. which you operate? I know that that's always a hot topic of the, yeah. the climate, the Israel climate on yeah, college in campuses. In some senses, campuses, the colleges have become the, 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 the battlefield for Israel advocacy. Uh, actually, <coughs> I'm very much aware of that also from a personal uh, 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 situation. Uh, my daughter, Ophir, just uh, arrived to New York mm. this last uh, summer, and she, she's a student in Columbia University, Wonderful. very active in the pro-Israel advocacy groups in Columbia, so I hear from her mm. uh, daily uh, updates on the situation there. Um, I must say I have the utmost admiration for the pro-Israel uh, activists in campus. Uh, it's not easy. I myself, uh, in some cases, I have wonderful experience in campuses. I must, for instance, uh, uh, one of the people say should, I should be surprised. Uh, one of the most liberal colleges in the country, in Swarthmore, mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Every year I come there to a, to a class uh, uh, given by a Palestinian uh, a lecturer. Um, uh, on war and conflict, and he opens it to the whole <coughs> college, and we have <coughs> we have always a, a really a fruitful discussion, uh, an open and, and, and positive and, and a fruitful discussion. In other cases, for instance, in in the City College of New York, I was almost physically attacked by <laughs> by by by, by uh, Palestinians and pro-Palestinians. Um, uh, that's an uh, what makes me optimist is the fact that uh, I see the quality of the pro-Israeli advocacy groups members there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, in s if I try to, to see, I mean, the, 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 the full ha half glass of, the, of, of, of water, mm -hmm. um, the situations they have to confront the pro-Israeli and Jewish, uh, Jewish and, not, and also non-Jewish pro-Israeli uh, uh, advocacy groups members prepare to, prepares them to be the leaders of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, if you sailed safely uh, pro-Israeli campus activity, you are much more prepared for the hardships of your leader right. uh, and for in general for the hardships of life. Right. Uh, and I have great admiration for the for the young men and women that uh, really carry on their shoulders uh, uh, some of the most difficult tasks of pro israeli advocacy today. That being said, I want also to add that, you know, we speak a lot about the BDS. And uh, we also must say that BDS is a total failure. Mm -hmm. um, the economic boycott is is, 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 a, is a resounding failure. Mm -hmm. Israeli economy is doing these days. It's really an economic miracle. Um, you know, um, I remember days in which uh, Israel had foreign exchange reserves that after the Yom Kippur war that were enough for two or three months of imports. And we were in the brink of bankruptcy. Mm. Today, the Bank of Israel has foreign exchange reserves in the excess of 100 billion with wow. a B dollars. I remember days in which we had 400 annual rate of inflation in the, four, in the 80s. Today the shekel is the strongest currency in the world. Um, <coughs> I remember, for instance, I, I, I already uh, mentioned it, but I remember um, when in the 90s AOL, American Online, acquired an Israeli company, ICQ, for $400 million. Mm -hmm. And we, w we thought it's surreal. It can't be true that an American company pays uh, $400 million for an Israeli one. Today, a $400 million deal barely makes the news <laughs> in Israel. Actually, we shattered in 2017 twice what I thought is the, the new glass sailing, the $10 billion mark. Pharmacai that we already mentioned, and, and uh, Mobileye in mm -hmm. the business of autonomous vehicles that was acquired by Intel by more than $15 billion. Wow. So 
uh, the Israeli economy. And in that respect, you know, Naomi, the, the president of Intel, the CEO of Intel, came to Israel to sign the papers and celebrate that the, the largest acquisition by Intel ever in the world. And he said something very interesting to the prime minister. In the context of the, all those talks about boycott of Israel, he said, Prime Minister, this is, not, this is our largest investment in Israel yet, but not our only one. We already invested billions of dollars on Israel. And I want you to know that for us in Intel, we see ourselves as an Israeli company, no less than an American mm. company. Mm -hmm. To say that in front of the calls to boycott Israel, he proudly says, we are an Israeli company. He didn't say it, but... but let's see you boycott us and return to the Stone Age without right. Intel products. Right. Right. That's quite a, a statement. That is quite a statement. And you know the cultural boycott also is a, a you name your mm -hmm. type of, the type of music you love right. and you will find a dozen of international famous performers in right. Tel Aviv that mm -hmm. will uh, 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 give you from I don't know, Madonna to right. Lady Gaga to Justin Elton Bieber, John, right. and even the, the oldies we had, uh, Paul Anka and Cliff Richards. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, uh, it's it's in, with all due respect, with the, with the exception of, of uh, the academy, faculty and students, which is worrisome, mm -hmm. um, BDS is a total failure. Right. And I do know that many of the student senate attempts to, to pass the BDS yeah. statements, they've all failed. Yes, yes. I, I'm not saying that in sure. campus we don't have problems. We sure. do have. But outside campus, outside the academic uh, uh, milieu, I think that is a total failure of uh, mm -hmm. BDS. Um, I will add more something else. Look. Um, um, Israel diplomatically has never been less isolated than these days. I challenge your, our viewers mm -hmm. to the following challenge. Mm -hmm. um, take a globe, mm -hmm. spin it, mm -hmm. and put your finger randomly in any place in the globe. If it's not an ocean, <laughs> we don't have diplomatic relations <laughs> with oceans yet. If it's not an ocean, and certain Western European countries, I, want to, I must admit, your finger will be in a place with which Israel improved its diplomatic relations dramatically mm -hmm. in the last years. From India to China to Australia to Canada to South America to uh, the Hellenic countries to the Eastern European countries, Africa we already mentioned. Sure. Uh, we, n we were never less isolated in the world than these days. Uh, I also, uh, we don't like so much to talk also about relationship with Arab countries, but uh, uh, we know that uh, in, in addition to Egypt and, and Jordan, with which have open diplomatic relations and, and very good relations with the governments, uh, there are more news in our relationship with Arab countries that we prefer, you know, at this stage. Uh, not to, to talk so much about, but even in that respect, there is mm -hmm. a, 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 a great advance. Why do you think that's, that's happened? What's, what's led us to get to this point? I think that uh, mainly uh, two causes. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu sometimes refers to it as TT, double T. The first one is technology. Mm -hmm. Israel today is the most advanced, uh, technologically advanced economy in the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, every January there is this um, Global Economic Forum convinced in a sleepy, uh, snowy community mm -hmm. in, uh, in Switzerland named Davos. Yep. And in advance uh, oh, of that, uh, uh, forum, they published a lot of uh, statistics, and so we were ranked number three as the most innovative economy in the world. I saw that uh, um, headline, I was happy, you know, number three is quite prestigious, uh, but I wanted to see who are the countries uh, that are ahead of us, the US, the UK, 
uh, Hong, uh, I don't know, South Korea, Germany, mm -hmm. England. So I clicked on that headline. One is the United States, makes sense. Well, the other was Switzerland, the organized. <laughs> <laughs> that's bias, that's bias. Now, without, with all due respect to my uh, Swiss friends and uh, mm -hmm. their, innova their innovation in producing cheese, <laughs> right, right. I believe we are more innovative. Mountains, than yes. <laughs> uh, so the number one reason is our uh, technological know-how. And the second, uh, unfortunately, we had to develop an expertise on anti-terrorism mm. ahead of all other countries in the world. Yep. In security, in cyber security, in ter anti-terrorism, that's the second T, mm -hmm. uh, terrorism, mm -hmm. anti-terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are the two badly needed uh, uh, commodities in the world these days, all over the world, uh, technology and, and, and security um, that uh, make uh, Israel so uh, welcome mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, uh, take for instance cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. um, I, a few months ago, I had a, a congressman from New Jersey in my office. Mm -hmm. And I told him, Congressman, you look tired. <laughs> he said, Well, yes, I am tired. He said, Why? I don't sleep well at night. Mm. Why don't you sleep well at night, Congressman? Have an election now? We don't have an election now. He said, No, you know, we had this in Congress, we had this uh, cybersecurity confidential classified briefing, and since then I cannot sleep well. I said, why? Well, what did they tell you? I said, look, I cannot share with you what they tell you, <laughs> but I will give you one piece of advice. He said to me, never accept a lapel pin from someone that you don't know. <laughs> because it can be an eavesdropping device oh. that transmits everything you say to Russia, or more dangerous even than Russia, to your wife. <laughs> 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 so that's cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is not the industry sure. of the future, it's the industry of the present. Sure. And we made uh, a, a, an effort, a conscious effort, to, to be, become a leader in cybersecurity, and we are. Mm -hmm. You know, Romy, um, the in 2014, we are only 8.5 million persons, 0.0 mm -hmm. something of the world population. In 2014, 10 percent of the investment in cybersecurity companies was in Israeli companies. In 2015, 20 percent, and now we stabilized around the 25 percent. Wow. That's incredible. You know, the uh, we have in Israel uh, the city of Beersheba. Mm -hmm in southern Israel. Mm -hmm. It was, it's called the capital of the Negev. Uh, uh, its claim to fame historically is Abraham, 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. But in the present, uh, in the la uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, it was a sleepy, uh, a, a dusty uh, a Bedouin market with camels roaming mm -hmm. and $1 a piece t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Today, Beersheba is becoming, and or maybe already became, the cybersecurity capital of the world. Right. Of the world, what we did in Beersheba, we concentrated in Beersheba the three legs of cybersecurity: the basic research done by the scientists of the Ben Gurion University in Beersheba, the users, military and civil users of cybersecurity, and the startup companies. Mm -hmm. All three are in the same campus, with really, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, creating an incredible synergy between them. And Beersheba is becoming the cybersecurity capital of the world. You know, I sometimes joke that I know about two models of uh, establishing a city in the desert. Mm -hmm. One is uh, Las Vegas, <laughs> uh, yep. based on gambling, uh, quick marriage, <laughs> and uh, I won't say what else. <laughs> and the other is the Israeli model. Beersheba with cyber security. I must admit, I prefer the Israeli model. Uh, me too. <laughs> I, feel <laughs> I feel with it more comfortable. Me too. <laughs> and you mentioned also the all this t startup nation in Israel, and, and it's now coming to New York. I've noticed there's yes. a lot of a lot of Israeli startups. First of all, uh, one of the my most proudest dates in New York was in September this year 
when I had the honor of participating in the opening of the Cornell Technion campus mm. in Roosevelt Island. Mm -hmm. Now look, this is amazing. An international tender for opening a, high, a, a technological graduate institute of the highest quality in the world uh, was published by Mayo Bloomberg with the best universities in the world participating. You know, my friend, Professor Peretz Lavi, the president of Technion, told me that when he was approached by Cornell to partner in that project, I mean, he, he was, it's a joke. We are going to be the, the partners of the uh, uh, Technological Institute of New York. Uh, and now is a reality. Mm -hmm. Now is a reality that uh, really makes us uh, extremely proud and will change the, 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 it will make New York, it will make it possible for New York to compete with Silicon Valley on the Western Coast. Uh, uh, on, on. And yes, we are, today we have some 300 or more Israeli companies, mm -hmm. technology companies that open shop in, in New York mm -hmm. um, in, in, in diverse areas. Although I must admit that uh, I do, I, I am in, I, I try to, to decentralize them. I always tell the Israeli entrepreneurs that come to New York, you don't necessarily need a 212 area code in mm -hmm. your business card. Go to the Bronx, go mm -hmm. to New Jersey, go to, don't concentrate only in Manhattan, but uh, Israel is like Manhattan. You right. know, that there, <laughs> right. is a, there is this uh, Israeli joke that say that, uh, Israelis are the only persons in the world that come to Manhattan to relax. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but yes, the uh, Israeli economy is, uh, is doing... By the way, people think that it's high-tech, but it's not only high-tech, it's innovation. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, a, a not so well-known fact is that Israel is the third largest exporter in the world after the US and the UK on television formats, mm -hmm. meaning ideas for television programs. Yeah. Um, some of them uh, dramas that were adapted to, 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 to the American television and, and, and also in, uh, but also yeah. reality shows mm -hmm. and, 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 and a, a lot div diverse uh, types of uh, mm -hmm. programs, quizzes. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's innovation. Also, we are very proud of our gastronomy oh, yeah. that is starting to to enter New York also, oh, we open, here, yeah. exactly, we have, sure. we have Chef Adoni and yeah. Chef Mesica and Chef uh, Shani and others that they, they are, Busta they and exactly, Barbara, they yeah, are going yeah. to revolutionize also mm -hmm. New York's uh, gastronomic oh, sense. Yeah, for uh, sure. that, so it's, it's innovation, it's not only technology. Oh, for sure. Well, Homeland, I know, was one of the first yes, TV shows, I believe, that, course, that, yes, and, uh, that came here. Uh, yes, definitely. And uh, so... In addition to that, we also discovered, uh, uh, you know, we always uh, lamented that Moses took, uh, took us to Israel and not to Saudi Arabia <laughs> with yeah. the huge right. reserves of, of oil. But now we discovered uh, finally, for the first time, really huge natural resources in the Mediterranean, in our maritime uh, uh, sea, uh, uh, in our territorial sea. Uh, um, huge reservoirs of natural gas that for the first time made the Israel uh, uh, independent, energy independent. So mm -hmm. we enter our, uh, well now uh, we are going to celebrate our 70th uh, Independence Day. We yeah. enter the new decade with great optimism. That's wonderful. Not with that, not being uh, uh, indifferent to the threats, obviously, sure. Iran and others, but uh, sure but with great optimism. Do you have a message to, to my peers out there, all the JD Corps, um, you know, 20s, 30s, early 40s, who are young professionals trying to better Israel's image, trying to work with others to well, first advocate? Well, first of all, if you didn't uh, yet, through birthright or, or any other uh, way, visit Israel. Mm -hmm. It's a life-changing experience. Mm -hmm. A visit to Israel is a life-changing experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it shatters the, 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 the stereotypes, it shatters so many uh, 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 wrong images. Uh, we really, <laughs> I'm not objective maybe, but it's really 
a, a wonderful country. It's beautiful, it's diverse, it's dynamic. Uh, uh, the diversity, for instance, of Israel. Uh, it's, it's, uh, people don't, don't understand how diverse Israel is, uh, how uh, uh, the, the human landscape of Israel and the geographical landscape of Israel is so diverse and so beautiful that I think that the first and foremost thing that, uh, and you know, <coughs> I always say now, uh, I don't care uh, if you, or I don't care so much <laughs> <laughs> if you agree with the, this or that policy of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you are not indifferent to Israel, uh, you can differ on any issue, and even on most issues with with Israeli policy, with Israeli government. In general, you don't have to agree with the Israeli uh, uh, policies to be pro-Israel. Right. Israel is a democratic country. Today we have this policy. Tomorrow we may change the policies. Uh, so um, we are, uh, don't, be, don't be indifferent to Israel. That is the, the, the most important thing you, ha you have. Every person has the right to, to criticize Israel. Uh, but what worries me is when people become, especially Jews in America, if they become indifferent to Israel. Mm -hmm. And I will say one more thing, you know, Naomi. Um, I hear that sometimes uh, 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 saying here in America, let's don't talk about Israel because it's a divisive issue. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Naomi, the Jewish people made a lot of contributions to the world, a lot in science, in philosophy, in religion, in, 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 in so many fields. Agreeing on important matters was not a Jewish contribution <laughs> to the world. We usually strongly, two Jews, three right. positions, exactly. three views. So we can uh, uh, dispute, we can differ on our opinions, but uh, we s we even in the family, where they have discrepancies and different opinions, we still sit together around the same uh, uh, seder, uh, Passover seder table, the same Rosh Hashanah table, and that what we have to do as a Jewish community and as a, as a, as a Jewish people. Well, that's a wonderful way to, to close this, this Thank interview. You so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Council General Dani Dayan. For your, for your time here at World Jewish Congress today. Again, I'm Naomi Reinhardt with World Thank Jewish you, Congress's Naomi. JD Corps. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit us online. This is the last webinar um, in the series, and we will start again in January for the second semester. Thank you Thank again you so, so much, much for your time. Take care.